So we're doing bending stress today. Um, tutorial, let me see, tutorial five, all about, tutorial five already, this is crazy. Man, time flies when you're having fun in your basement. Um, seems like just yesterday we were doing this for the first time. Should stop looking at my uh, iPad screen and start looking at you guys out there. It's, it's hard to get used to looking at, uh, you know, essentially nothing just just a phone on a tripod um, so much more tempting to look at a screen <sighs> okay uh, so hearing no other questions how many people do we have with us now and check it out oh yeah we've got a whole slew of people great 20 people they're still coming Okay, um, so like I said, today we're going to do a couple of problems involving uh, bending stress. And you'll, you'll find that all of the problems now, they're going to start becoming a little bit longer. Um, because everything that you've learned so far is going to be rolled up, start getting rolled up into single problems. And, um, and by the time a couple of more tutorial problems go by, when we do one of the problems, it's going to encompass like the full learning of what you've done so far. This is why this course is so cool. Um, and, and engineering in general, you know, it really builds upon itself. So, you, you know, you, uh, you can't succeed with the latter stuff until you master the, the earlier stuff. Um, so it's, it's super important to stay on top of everything. Um, okay, so a couple of a couple of problems to practice uh, how to calculate um, bending stresses in uh, beams. Bending stresses are stresses due to internal moments. Okay, so I've picked uh, I've picked three problems to do with you today um, to help you understand this material a little bit better. So I'm going to throw the first one up on the uh, on the board here. Um, so we've got a beam that looks like this. It's got a pin over here and a roller over here, and it's got a couple of 10 kilonewton loads sitting on top of it, uh, like so. And then around this point on top of the roller, we also have a point moment that has a value of 15 kilonewton meters acting upon it. And all of these uh, different elements that are the important bits are all spaced by uh, two meters longitudinally. And now um, when we get into problems looking at bending stress, not only are you shown the longitudinal picture of the beam, but you're also shown the cross section of the beam. So the cross section of the beam looks like this. In this case, it's a box beam. Box beam, exactly what it sounds like. Cross section is a box shape. And this is going to have a height of 300 millimeters and a width or depth, whichever you prefer, of 150 millimeters. And the wall thickness, uh, T, I don't need to put T there. Actually, I, I realized it when I when I erase with my finger, it makes a mess in the video from the other side. So I should erase with the eraser. Um, this is 20 millimeters wall thickness. And over here, same thing, constant wall thickness of uh, 20 millimeters all the way around. Okay, so here you've got the graphics for the problem. So the problem statement uh, says this. So um, a, a red spruce beam um, is subjected to the loading shown determine the beam's safety factor considering only bending stress. Okay, so we've got a red spruce beam. Uh, determine safety factor considering only Ending 
stress. Okay, great. All right, so let's uh, let's talk uh, conceptually about this problem um, before we get started. Um, so we know what the equation is now for um, stress due to bending. We've got sigma equals m y over i, where uh, sigma is the normal stress caused by the internal bending moment m. That's the internal moment m that exists at some longitudinal position uh, of interest. Usually, because you're interested in the greatest stress, you want the maximum internal moment here. And y is the particular location within the cross section of the object that you're uh, considering relative to the centroidal axis of bending for internal moment m. And i is the moment of inertia about that centroidal uh, axis of bending. So in this problem, we want to determine the safety factor. Uh, we're told this is uh, red spruce, so it's uh, wood, and that means that it will have an ultimate strength, but not a yield strength, okay, because wood doesn't yield. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to set the left-hand side of our equation equal to the ultimate strength divided by our safety factor, and then over on the right-hand side of the equation, we want the maximum bending stress within this beam, okay? So to get the maximum bending stress, we want to use the maximum moment in this equation, okay? So that's going to give us the longitudinal position where um, we are, or rather, the longitudinal position with the maximum moment is, is the longitudinal position where we'll be calculating the stress or determining what the minimum safety factor is. And then the distance y here. So for a box beam, right, the centroid is right in the center because it's a symmetric shape. And because the orientation of the beam is shown relative to the longitudinal picture of the beam like this, then the moments that are occurring are going to be about the horizontal centroidal axis. So axis, let's call it XX like that. So there's the axis that our maximum moment is acting about. Now, I've just drawn on the maximum moment acting in that direction as, as an example for what I'm talking about relative to this. That's not actual direction that the maximum moment might be acting in. We'll figure that out uh, as we move through the problem. The distance y, right? Bending stress increases as we increase variable y, which is our distance away from the axis of bending. So the farthest we can go away from the axis of bending in this case is all the way to the top of the beam, right? That's the maximum value of y here, y max, or equivalently, all the way to the bottom of the beam too, right? That's y max as well, because the center is in the center. Distance to the bottom is the same as the distance to the top. So the stresses on the bottom of the beam will be equal in magnitude to the stresses on the top of the beam because they're both uh, the materials the same distance y away from the neutral axis of bending. But uh, one set of stresses, let's say along the top, will be in compression while the other set is in tension or vice versa. Um, so we want uh, y max over here and then i x x um, down there. Okay, so we're, we're setting up our problem now. We've got a general equation that we, uh, we need to deal with. I is easy to find here. We know what Y max is, half the height of the cross section, 150 millimeters. Uh, maximum moment in this equation, we're gonna get that from our moment diagram, right? We'll draw the shear and moment diagrams here. The maximum moment gives us M max. And then the only other thing to consider is um, sigma U here. So if we talk about wood for a second, if, if you have a board of uh, a wooden board like this, 
Um, wooden boards are cut along the length of trees, right? Um, so the what's called the grain direction in the wood or the fiber direction is going to be roughly parallel to the length of the wood, right? So this is going to be the the grain direction right there, also known also called the fiber direction. Um, now, if you look on the material property tables for wood, um, and uh, I'm just checking out my material property tables as well, you have a copy of it. But if you either on the metric or the um, or the U.S. side, it doesn't matter. But if you look at the um, the properties for wood, you'll see that there's a column for modulus of elasticity, and then three columns that give you strengths for wood when your stresses are parallel to the grain or parallel to the fiber direction. And then you've got another set of strengths for when stresses are perpendicular to the fiber direction. You can imagine that it's much easier to pull fibers apart from one another than it is to uh, stretch them longitudinally. Right, so equivalently, if you look at the, the two last columns, the ultimate strength perpendicular to the grain, which are these ones, those strength values are much lower than the strength values uh, parallel to the grain. So in terms of bending, because the fiber direction is parallel with length, you always wanna be using the strength values um, that are taken parallel to the grain, okay? So um, if we look at those values um, for sigma u parallel to grain of wood, we've got uh, what? And I'm reading off the values here for red spruce in metric units. So we've got a value for ultimate tensile strength and that for red spruce is 74 megapascals. And we've got an ultimate strength for compressive stress, and that is 38.2 megapascals, okay? Now, again, on one side of the beam or on the top, we'll have tensile or compressive stress, and on the bottom, we'll have the reverse. So if we have compressive stress at the top, we'll have tensile stress at the bottom. Tensile stress at the bottom, we'll have compressive stress at the top. Because the distance to the bottom or the top are the same, the magnitude of tensile and compressive stress will be equal. So what's going to be um, the limiting factor in terms of failure of this beam, or what's gonna set the minimum safety factor that the beam has? Is it going to be uh, the tensile strength of the wood, or is it gonna be the compressive strength of the wood? And the answer is the compressive strength of the wood, right? Because um, the wood is weaker in compression, levels of stress are gonna be the same tension in compression, so compressive failure is going to occur before tensile failure does, and it's the uh, compressive strength that will be the limiting factor. So if we take this equation down further, what we really wanna do is the ultimate compressive strength divided by the safety factor, we're gonna set equal to m max, y max, over i x x okay so that is the conceptual path that we need to take to solve this problem any questions about that conceptual piece before we actually start doing some math and drawing some shear and moment diagrams here Does everything always break sooner in compression? No, absolutely not. Um, so it depends on the material, right? Um, so things like brittle materials like concrete or cast iron, 
Um, those are much, much stronger in compression than they are in tension. And in fact, if you look at your material property table for something like concrete, you will see that um, it is so weak in tension that we actually assign it a value of, of zero tensile strength in the table. Um, so it really depends on the material. Now, for the ductile metals that we've been dealing a lot with, the um, the steels, the aluminums, uh, we haven't done a problem with titanium, I don't think, but there's titanium in the table. Um, those materials have equal strength and tension and compression, so you, you never have to worry about it. Um, but for other materials, the properties are different, tension and compression. So one needs to uh, consider both um, the stresses that are existing as well as the differences in strength. Okay, so let us replace, do an erase and replace here, and we'll uh, change this into a free body diagram. So we'll make this uh, support reaction BY and support reaction AY here. I'm not gonna bother putting on AX since we know it's zero anyway. And then I'm gonna do some erasing here and give ourselves some space um, to do uh, to do some math. Okay, um, you guys know how to do uh, support reactions uh, by now, but we'll just write out this one um, just to make sure everybody's absolutely clear on on the point moment. So if we're going to find by and we do the sum of the moments about point A is equal to zero, we have what? 10 for this load multiplied by a moment arm of two meters plus 10 kilonewtons for this load multiplied by a moment arm of four meters plus 15 kilonewton meters that's in the same direction as these two uh, 10 kilonewton moments in terms of causing a moment about point A and that's all balanced by BY multiplied by its moment arm 246. Okay. Important point again is that this 15, even though it acts at a distance of six meters from point A, doesn't get multiplied by anything. Um, BY is a value of 12.5 kilonewtons. I'm gonna put that right here because I predict that I'll want to erase what, I, erase what I've just written. And AY, when you work that out, um, comes out to be 7.5 kilonewtons. Okay, some of the forces in the Y direction has to be equal to zero. So now let's draw our shear and moment diagram. So we'll do our shear drag diagram in units of kilonewtons here. Okay, and we'll do our moment diagram in units of kilonewton meters. Now, remember, the only, the only reason we're drawing a moment diagram right now is for the purpose of determining what the maximum moment is. In certain cases, it will be immediately obvious when you look at a beam where the maximum moment is. So sometimes it's just more efficient to do a section cut at that location where you know the maximum moment is and analyze one side or the other side of the free body diagram in order to find out the value. But if you don't know exactly where the maximum moment is, then drawing the shear and moment diagram is the fastest route to figuring that out. So starting with the shear diagram, and let's do our couple of uh, lines here, our construction lines to help us draw this. I've got the bad habit of tapping on this piece of glass at exactly uh, the resonance frequency of it and uh, I don't want to have a six by four foot piece of glass uh, come out of this frame and land on my toe. Um, <laughs> that, would be, that would be the end of the toe. Um, okay, zero. We're jumping up by 7.5 kilonewtons. There we go. I would make for quite a video. Professor drops giant sheet of glass on toe, toes severed live on video. Okay, we're jumping down by 10 now, so that gives us minus 2.5.
Uh, again, look at the distributed load, zero distributed load, zero slope, so we're going straight across. Uh, come to another uh, minus 10 here, so we're dropping down by another 10. That leaves us with minus 12 and a half. Then we're continuing over straight zero slope because there's zero distributed load, right? Hopefully now that you guys have done the problem set, uh, for the last one, you're getting the hang of drawing these shear diagrams and the moment diagrams fairly quickly. We're at minus 12.5. We jump up by 12.5. That brings us back to zero exactly where we should be getting to. So we'll shade this in uh, like so. There we go. All right, now we can draw the moment diagram. So let's put the start and the end points. We know we have to start and end at zero here. Um, only one point moment at the end, so we know there's gonna be a vertical jump. Is that a question or are you just chatting on, on the other end there? You've been here, have you? Oh, who's jibber jabbering? Stop making noise and can't identify me. Okay. Bring back up the chat. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's draw the moment diagram. Um, so constant positive values means that we're going to have a constant positive slope for the moment diagram like this. Where do we get to the change between these two points is the area in the corresponding portion of the shear diagram. 7.5 multiplied by 2 uh, gives us... 15, so we're up there, positive 15. Uh, then we have constant negative values, so we have to have a constant negative slope, something like that. Uh, where do we get to here? Well, we take our starting value, 15, and sub or add on the area in the corresponding portion of the shear diagram, right? So that's my 15 plus minus 2.5 multiplied by 2. Plus minus 2.5 multiplied by 2 gives us 10. Uh, 7.5, uh, this point right here. Yep, so that, that point should be the area within this portion of the shear diagram, so 7.5 by 2. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's fair. Yeah. Um, let me let me let me make it more legible. So seven point five multiplied by two. Okay. Thank you. Th thank you for asking. Um, because as always, if if one person's got a question, uh, there's probably at least ten or twelve other people on the call scratching their heads about the same thing. Um, and, and that goes for anybody, right? If, if, <laughs> if you're any, ever having a trouble uh, interpreting my scribbles, don't, don't be afraid to tell me that uh, I've, my handwriting has degenerated into the excessively sloppy category or territory. Um, so now, from this point here, we've got more constant negative values, and they're larger negative values, so we have to have a steeper negative slope. Right, so the line's got to be steeper. It remains linear because this line still has constant values. Uh, where do we get to? Well, same deal. We take the starting value over here at L equals 4, and then we add on the um, corresponding area from this portion of the shear diagram now, okay, which is what? Plus minus 12.5, minus 12.5 multiplied by another 2. Oh man, the math is getting tricky here. So we've got uh, minus 25 here, plus 10, so we're at minus 15, okay? And then what happens? Well, we need to get back to zero. Fortunately, there's a point moment here and it's clockwise, so we're jumping up by its magnitude 15. Hey, that brings us straight back up to zero. Great, so we've done the moment diagram properly. We've done both 
So we've, we've got back to zero for our moment diagram. We've got, got back to zero for a shear diagram. That tells us we've done the support reactions properly. We've done the shear diagram properly and we've done the moment diagram properly. So that's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> now we can clearly see where our uh, maximum moments in this case are, right? We've got two maximum moments. We've got 15 kilonewton meters over here, and we've got 15 kilonewton meters over there, right? So looking at this beam, right, if you just looked at it, you'd have a hard time probably determining where the maximum moment is gonna be just, just looking at it. Um, but by drawing the moment diagram, it becomes really obvious where the maximum moments are. Um, right, in this case, it doesn't matter whether we use the maximum moment over here, here at L equals two or the maximum moment over here, L equals six. Let's talk about those both for a second. So let's talk about at L equals two. Right, if we took a section cut at L equals two and drew one half of that beam, okay, here's the rest of it going off in three dimensions now. So here's point A over here and our section surface is this surface right here. Here's our centroid, here's our centroidal axis of bending. Which direction is this maximum moment in at this location uh, L equals two meters, right? If, you, if you're thinking about this, um, what you need to remember is the convention that we established where positive internal moments place the top of the beam in compression or they bend beams into a uh, smiley face. So positive internal moments bend beams into a smiley face where they're placing uh, the top of a beam under compression and the bottom of the beam in tension. So this is a positive internal moment, so it must be placing the top of the beam in compression. So the direction of the internal moment is like this, uh, M equals 15 kilonewton meters, okay? If we look at the um, other maximum moment, right, on the other uh, end of the beam, and if we draw the same sort of drawing here, so now we're way over at the other end of the beam, where point A is way over here now, and this is L equals six, right? This is all cut section. Um, here's our centroidal axis of bending. Over at this side, the maximum moment is in the other direction. Why? Because it's negative, so it's placing the bottom of the beam in compression and the top of the beam uh, in tension. All right, um, so let's return to our equation here and actually go ahead and solve it now. And I'm just gonna erase this and then I'll check to see if anybody's put a question into the chat. Leave that up there because we'll need that number. Hey, no problem. Um, was there an actual uh, another question there? No. Okay. All right. Um, so let's take this. So we're taking this equation now, and I'm bringing it back up, and we're going to fill it in. Okay. So we've got the compressive strength of the wood is 38.2 megapascals. So we've got 38.2 times 10 to the 6 to put that into units of pascals. We've got our safety factor down here, which is what we're looking for. Our maximum moment, again, it doesn't matter which you use. And when you do um, a stress equation like this, you want your uh, maximum moment as a positive value. So we're going to put in uh, 15 kilonewtons, 15 times 10 to the 3. Your distance y, again, it doesn't matter if you are looking at um, the compressive stress down here, right? So this is the maximum, sorry, 
that's the tensile stress for that direction of moment. Right, so in this cut section, the compressive stress, this is going to be sigma max compression, right, because the direction of that internal moment is taking the material on the top of the beam and pushing it in on itself and taking the material at the bottom of the beam and pulling it out. You can imagine taking this cross section here and rotating it about the centroidal axis in the direction of internal moment m, right, pushing in on the top, pulling out on the bottom. And here, the compressive stress is down there, the maximum compressive stress. Sigma max compression, right there. And uh, the distance y is the same for either of those scenarios. Uh, in either case, it's half the height of the cross section. So we've got 150 millimeters, 0.15 meters, divided by Ixx. So here we're doing 1 12th, and then uh, our base for our external, right? So our external base, base is always the dimension that is parallel to the centroidal axis that you're considering. So in the problem statement, that was listed as 150 millimeters. So 0 0.15 multiplied by the height cubed, 0 0.3 cubed, 300 millimeters. And then we're subtracting off the same 1 12th base height cubed for the inner portion of the beam that's missing. So we're subtracting 1 12th base height cubed for the gap portion in the middle. And I think I said that the wall thickness here was, let's say, 4 millimeters? No, I said 20 millimeters. Right? This was 20 millimeters. So um, I've factored out my 1 12th here. So now I'm putting the base for the inner. So that's going to be 150 millimeters minus 20 on this side, minus 20 on this side, leaving me with 110. And then for height, I've got 300 minus 20 minus 20. That's 260 cubed. And then my curly bracket to close that. That's cubed there. There we go. Okay, so that's your equation that allows you to solve for what the smallest safety factor is in this beam here under this loading situation. Okay, which is which is the smallest safety factor, and something is always the safety factor that's interesting because that tells you how close uh, an object is to failing. So when I did this, I got uh, two point. What did I get? Two point nine eight. 2.98, right? Um, if you were rounding this to one decimal, let's say, rounding to one decimal, then our safety factor is what? It has to be rounded down to 2.9 because if you round it up to 3.0, you'd be over-representing how safe something is. And you can't over-represent how safe something is. Um, you always have to err on the side of caution here. Okay, um, questions about that problem. Pretty, pretty basic one to get us started, but the first problem that we've done involving using wood as a material um, so important to understand the difference between the strengths for the different fiber directions or the grain directions in the table, um, as well as realizing that there are differences in strength for tension and compression and knowing which one of those two uh, choose. Okay, I'll do uh, I'll do a little bit of racing here. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, by the way, if anybody ever has any feedback about you know um, 
ideas you have for maybe how this this tutorial could be more engaging for you or um, ideas about how the course could be improved in terms of uh, you learning the material uh, better, please do share them. I'm always looking to make improvements to the course. So a lot of the a lot of the elements from this course came directly from feedback from people just like you right who are sitting there doing this material and thinking about ways that the learning experience could be better so for example the textbook i wasn't going to write a textbook for this course until somebody suggested that it might be really helpful and then i started thinking about it and i was like yeah I'm really upset that students have to pay $250 for a textbook and they only have to use like a third or a quarter of it for the course. It would be nice if there was a textbook specific to the course, right? So, so improvements happen um, when, you, uh, when you flag them. Um, okay, let's go on to the second problem. Okay. There's our beam, uh, we've got a pin there, we've got a roller about there, and we've got a distributed load that's sitting from the end to the pin like this, value of 45 kilonewtons for every meter of length one big load right in the center with a value of 100 kilonewtons and another distributed load that's a little bit larger than the one on the left whose value is 60 kilonewtons per meter. And then some distances would be uh, helpful. So what have we got? We've got three meters, eight meters, and another three meters. Okay, the cross section for the beam looks like this. The beam is a channel section. Channel is a cross section that looks like that there. It can be one way up or the other way up. Um, and the total height of this channel section is 300 millimeters and the total width is 450 millimeters. This distance is 40 millimeters there and this thickness here is also 40 millimeters. Okay, so let's see what the problem statement says. Channel beam is designed with a safety factor of two. So the design safety factor is 2.5, 2.5. I, I think I said two, but it's 2.5. Uh, when loaded as shown, determine the maximum stress due to bending within the beam. Um, so what we want is sigma max due to bending. Okay, pretty straightforward. All right, so we're talking about bending stress again, of course, because that's the theme of today's lecture or tutorial, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this learning opportunity that you're engaging in. Um, sigma is my divided by i. Okay, so if we want sigma max here, how do we get the maximum stress due to bending? Well, we make all of the variables that we can change. Uh, maximum on the top, minimum on the bottom. Um, M, we want the maximum stress due to bending. Y, we want the maximum distance that we can go within the cross section relative to the centroidal axis of bending of the maximum moment. And I, I is not something we can change. I is just the property of the cross section about the centroidal axis for the moment, okay? So if we look at the shape of the cross section, this channel section here. Okay. 
If, if we had this extra bottom piece to make it a box beam, right, then the centroid would be uh, right in the center. But we don't have that material there. So the absence of that material means the centroid moves upwards. So the centroid location is closer to the top than it is to the bottom, right? So here's our centroidal axis of bending. The farthest distance perpendicular to that line that we can go is all the way down to the bottom of the cross section, right? So this distance here is y max, right there, that distance there. And all of the locations at the bottom of the cross section there, those are going to be the locations of the maximum tensile, or not maximum tensile, too early to say that, the maximum stress due to bending within the beam. Okay? Whether it's tensile stress or compressive stress remains to be determined from the, um, the sign of the maximum moment in the moment diagram. Okay, so uh, we know what we need to do for maximum moment. That's just drawing the moment diagram. We know uh, what we have for y max. For i, here we're going to want i x x. In order to get i x x, right, we can't use simple superposition for this shape because it's not symmetric about our centroidal axis of bending. Um, so we're going to have to use the uh, second moment of area sort of equation to find what the centroid is y bar uh, for this channel section. And whatever we find y bar it, it to be using the equation uh, sum of a y bar for the component shapes over sum of the component shape areas. Let's try that again, sum of a. Uh, whatever y bar is, that will be equal to our value of y max, okay? And then we can calculate ixx once we know y bar using the parallel axis theorem, okay? All right, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and deal with finding our maximum moment as a starting point, okay? So let's first remove these supports here and we'll put in a y and b y i'm just going to bring this down like that okay and like that there we go um and i don't think there's any additional uh value in this point of doing those equations out. so i'm just going to tell you what the support reactions come out to b so by, we've got 238.4 kilonewtons to 38.4 kilonewtons by doing some of the moments about point A and then by doing some of the forces in the Y direction, you get AY 176.6. 100, that's a 76.6 kilonewtons, okay? So let's go ahead and draw our shear and moment diagrams. Uh, the only reason we're drawing the shear diagram is to get the moment diagram. And the only reason we're drawing the moment diagram is to get the maximum moment. Shear in units of kilonewtons. Moment in units of kilonewton meters. Continue this down like that, down like that, so on and so forth. There we go. Okay, here we go. Start from zero. Uh, constant negative values of distributed load, that's minus 45, 45 downwards, so we have to have a line with constant negative slope, minus 45. Where we get to is the area contained within that distributed load, which is 45 multiplied by three. So that's what, minus 135, minus 135. Three times four is 12, plus another 15, yeah. 
Um, and then we go up by 176, right? There we go. So that gives us 41.6 there. And then now we have no distributed loads. So we continue over like this. And then we jump down by 100. Okay, there we go. So what have we got? Uh, left there, we've got 50 minus 58.4 there. And then no distributed load again. So we continue over up by 238.4. It's going to bring us up somewhere like that. And what does that leave us with? This is where I cheat 180. And then from there, we know we've got constant negative values, so constant negative slope. We've got to get back to zero. Do we actually get back to zero? 180 plus negative 60 multiplied by 3, 3 sixths or 18. Yes, it checks out. So everything's good there for the shear diagram. Okay, now we came up here and I failed to connect that like that. All right, looking good. Um, moment diagram. Now I'm going to do a correction of my axis location here. I'll move it up like that to give myself more space on the negative side. Um, starts at zero, ends at zero. We've got negative values, so the moment diagram has to start with a negative slope, right? Um, the values become larger negative numbers, so the slope has to become a steeper and steeper negative slope. So we have something that starts off as a low negative slope and becomes steeper and steeper like that. And I'm going to, I'm going to do the, the drawing first and then we'll calculate the values, okay? Um, so after we reach that point, then we go to something that has constant positive values. So we have a constant positive slope, right? Something like that. Then we have constant negative values. So we have a constant negative slope. And then we have, um, all of a sudden we go from negative values to positive values, but those positive values are becoming smaller and smaller numbers. So our positive slope needs to start steeply because this is a large positive number. And then it needs to get to be a smaller and smaller positive slope. So something like that, okay? So let's, let's go ahead and calculate the values now. So this value down here, the change from zero to that value is going to be equal to the area within the corresponding portion of the shear diagram, right? So we've got one half, our base three, and our height of that triangle, uh, 135, right, for that. So that is minus 202.5, okay? And then to get this value here, this value right here, we're taking the starting value, minus 202.5, and adding on the area of the corresponding portion of the shear diagram. So this is this area here so we've got plus 41.6 multiplied by this is supposed to be in the very center by the way i didn't uh, write that on the diagram but that should be four meters there um <clears throat> so we've got 41.6 multiplied by four so that's going to give us 36 point 
2 minus 36.2. Six point two, and then for this value here, we're just taking our minus thirty six point two, and then we're adding on the corresponding portion, corresponding area under within the shear diagram. So that's minus fifty four multiplied by another four. Fifty. 58.4 multiplied by 4. All right, what did I get when I did that? Minus 270. Okay. So this point here, that point here is our maximum moment M max. It's a really ugly hollowed annotation, there we go. Okay, so we figured out what the maximum moment is, right? So now, um, if we think about the direction of the moment at that location, based on the sign of this moment is the top of the beam or bottom of the beam in compression. Positive internal moments put the top of the beam in compression. So this is a negative internal moment. So it's going to place the bottom of the beam in compression. So here, this maximum stress here is going to be a compressive stress. right? And then the greatest tensile stress in the beam right? here is going to be at the top. Now, the value of the maximum tensile stress is not equal to the value of the maximum compressive stress because the distance y bar here, the distance y max here, is not the same as the distance y from the centroidal axis to the top of the beam. Okay, um, so let's go ahead. We've, we've figured out what this is. Uh, we can get y max by figuring out y bar. So that's the next thing to do there. So let's go ahead and figure out what, um, what our value of y bar is. So we do that by using the equation sum of a y bar over sum of the areas where we're breaking our object up into um, component rectangles, right? So here I'll break this object up this way. So we've got one piece like this, piece one, and then we've got two other rectangular shapes, um, piece two and piece two, right? So uh, for area one, that area is what? 450 multiplied by 40. And I'm just gonna use units in millimeters for uh, this part here. So 450 multiplied by 40. And then Y bar for shape one. Y bar, you need to measure um, the centroidal axis of the component shape you're considering relative to the datum that you're using for the whole shape. So I always take my datum as the bottom of the cross section. So this distance here is y bar one, or y bar for shape one, y bar one. Um, so that's going to be 300 minus, what, 20, uh, 280. So we've got 280, okay? And then we add on the same thing, a y bar, right? This is a one, uh, a one, y one bar. Same thing for shape two, but there's two of these guys. So we have to multiply the whole thing uh, by two. We just do one of them and multiply it by two. So we've got 40 multiplied by 300 minus 40. So 40 multiplied by 260 here. Okay, probably going off the board um, a little bit. So let's just shift things over a tiny bit. So 
y bar equals sum of a y bar over sum of a equals, uh, what do we have, 450 multiplied by 40 multiplied by 280 plus 2 times 40 multiplied by 260 multiplied by y2 bar, right? This distance here, y bar 2, y2 bar, um, half of 260. So we've got 130 here. And then we do the sum of the areas down here. So we've got 450 multiplied by 40 plus 2 times 40 multiplied by 260 down there. And that will give us our value of y bar. I got 199.6 millimeters when I did that calculation. 199.6 millimeters. All right, um, now let's do the parallel axis theorem. So parallel axis theorem. So I xx for the whole shape here is going to be the sum of I xx plus A D squared for the component shapes. The same component shapes, shapes one and two here. So we're just breaking things, we're just breaking things up with these two equations into shapes where we know the centroid location for those shapes. So for IXX for shape number one, we're calculating I for shape number one about its own horizontal centroidal axis. So that's 1 12th, the base is 450, and I'm gonna to switch to doing this in meters now so that my I value comes out in meters to the fourth um, and we want meters for our stress equation or our equation for bending stress. 1 12th base height cubed, so the height is 40 millimeters, 0 0.04 meters, cube that, plus add on the area, 0 0.45 multiplied by 0 0.04, and then the quantity d squared. The quantity d squared is the distance between the centroidal location for the whole cross section and the centroidal location for the component shape that you're considering. So here's the centroid. I'll just do this a hollow circle there. There's the centroid for the whole cross section. So this is y bar overall, which is our 199.6 millimeters. Our distance D here for the first shape is the distance uh, between the centroidal axis for the component shape we're considering and the centroidal axis for the whole cross section. So that is relative to the datum, which was the base measuring all the way up to the centroid for shape one was 280 millimeters. And to get the distance in between here, we're subtracting the height of y bar. So here we want uh, 280 minus 0 0.1996 and then square that difference. And then we're adding on the same thing for the second shape, but there's two of them. So we need to multiply the whole thing by two. And we've got 1 12th now just for one of them, 1 12th base the base in this case is the 40 millimeter distance, so 0 0.04. And the height is, we already said 260, 0 0.26 cube that, add back on the area, 0 0.04, 0 0.26. And our distance D squared is the distance between these two centroidal, horizontal centroidal axes. Okay, so we go all the way up to y bar and then take off y2 bar to get that distance d. So we've got 0 0.1996 minus 130, 0 0.13, and square that. And then we'll close our curly bracket like this. Okay, so that's going to give us our value of i. Three point three six seven times ten to the negative four. And 
10 units, meters to the fourth power, right? Meters cubed, meters to the fourth. Okay, so let's go ahead now and do our equation for maximum bending stress. Now that we've got all the components that we need to answer that question. So again, we're saying sigma max is going to be equal to the maximum moment, maximum value of y divided by m max, y max divided by i x x. Maximum moment was 270 units of kilonewtons meters. So this goes in as 270 times 10 to the three to put it in units of newton meters. Maximum value of y, we're going from the centroidal axis all the way down to the bottom of the cross section, uh, 199.6 meters divided by our value of ixx, 3.367 3.367 times 10 to the minus four meters, okay. All right, uh, let's see what we get. 160 megapascals. Okay. All right, questions about that one from anybody, anything that you didn't follow, anything that you uh, missed while you were writing things down and you'd like me to go over again. Yes. Uh, up, up, yeah, this value, 280, yeah, and 130, sure. Um, so if we just do a quick erase here to give ourselves some space, that's a good question because I'm sure one of your colleagues is wondering the exact same thing. Right. Um, the total height here was 300 millimeters and this distance there was 40 millimeters. Okay, so we're breaking it up into two pieces. Okay, this in, for this first piece here, this is this is uh, A1 and then this is Y bar one here. Um, for Y bar one, right? So this, this shaded shape is our area uh, A1. And Y bar one is the distance between the centroid of that shape and our reference datum which we're taking to be the base of the cross section. So this distance here is y bar one. So the 280 comes from just taking 300, which is the distance from the datum to the very top, and then subtracting half of the thickness of this top piece here, which is 20. So that gives us 280 there. And then the 130, is exactly the same, but for the second component shape that we were doing over here. So we wanted uh, y bar two here. So we're taking this height here, which is 300 minus 40 gives us 260 millimeters, and then dividing that by two, because we know that for this shape, the center is gonna be exactly in the center. So this is the 130 there. Is that helpful? Yeah, no problem. And I see another question in the chat here. Aren't we forgetting the safety factor? 
Yeah, so I was hoping somebody would ask that. We were, we were told in this question that the beam was designed with a safety factor of 2.5, right? And what the question asked us was, what's the maximum stress due to bending within the beam, right? What the maximum stress is within the beam under a given loading scenario has nothing to do with the safety factor. So that's just an extra piece of information that's actually not relevant to our calculation, right? Um, the beam could have been designed with whatever safety factor, but that doesn't change what the actual stress within the beam is. Unless, of course, the stress is so high that given the material of the beam, uh, the beam would, would be broken. Um, but um, I, let's see here. Yeah, we're not told anything about the material. Um, so again, a piece, a piece of information that was given that isn't relevant to, um, to the actual uh, quantity that we were asked for in the problem. I didn't hatch this uh, moment diagram. Okay, any uh, any other questions? Did that did that answer about the safety factor make sense? Uh, not seeing any other questions about this problem, so we'll do some erasing here and we'll move on to the third and final problem for you. Okay, let's check this third one out. Okay, third problem. Pin over here. Roller over here, and we've got a uniform distributed load over the entire length. Four kilonewtons per meter. Man, all these all these SI problems today. What is up with this? Three meters. Okay, uh, cross section of the beam looks like so. So it's an upside down T beam here, and we've got what? 50 millimeters here, 50 millimeters here. This is 180, this distance is 160 millimeters, there we go. All right, um, anything that I'm missing? No, from the sketches, no. Okay, a T-shaped beam is made of two red spruce boards nailed together. Okay, 
In both boards, the grain direction is parallel to the beam's length. Yep, as would normally be uh, assumed. Considering only stress due to bending, determine the beam's safety factor. Okay, so considering only bending, determine the red spruce beams safety factor. It's more of a statement than a question. Okay, um, so let's see what we've got here. Uh, red spruce, we know all about red spruce now, right? Differing uh, values of ultimate strength in compression compared to tension, right? So this one was 38.2 megapascals. My memory is correct. And the other one was uh, 70 something. Let's see, red spruce, 38.274 megapascals. Okay. All right, um, so the equation that we're gonna be using again is the ultimate strength divided by our safety factor is going to be uh, our maximum moment, maximum value of Y divided by I here. Okay, so um, before we talk too much about, um, about applying that equation, Let's, let's go ahead and get some of the basic stuff that we're going to um, need. We're gonna need our maximum moment. We're gonna need um, the centroidal location for the entire cross section. If we're measuring our um, location of the cross section centroid relative to uh, the base, which I like to do, um, but you can measure it from the top if you want, um, then the centroid is closer to the bottom than it is to the top. So we've got this distance y bar um, there. So we need y bar to get y max and we need uh, maximum moment. Okay, so let's, um, let's change this to a free body diagram and draw our shear and moment diagrams to get the maximum uh, moment. So we've got a y here and we've got b y uh, there and I'll just write the values of them on because you're all great at doing uh, support reactions. 6.4 kilonewtons and 25.6 kilonewtons. 6.4, I'll write that a little bit bigger for you. 6.4 kilonewtons and 25.6 kilonewtons. Um, so, shear and moment diagrams, first of all, V kilonewtons. Moment, kilonewton meters. All right, uh, shear diagram starts at zero, ends at zero. First thing we do is jump up by 6.4 because of support reaction AY. Then we've got uh, constant negative values of distributed load. So we have a constant negative slope like this. Where do we get to 6.4? plus the area within the distributed load is minus four multiplied by a distance of five. Uh, that's minus 20, so 13.6 negative, 13.6 there. And then we jump up by 25.6. Uh, there we go. So adding on 25.6, 
to 13.6 gives us positive uh, 12. And then we've got, again, constant negative values, so constant negative slope, and that's got to take us back to zero. Uh, let's do our check. 12 should equal the area within this portion of the distributed load. 4 times 3 is 12. Okay, all good. All right, perfect. Now, again, move this line up a little bit here. Here we go. We've got negative values that are becoming increasingly large negative values. So we need a line that has a negative slope that's becoming an increasingly uh, steep negative slope. And then we change suddenly from a line with a large negative slope to a large positive slope. And then the values are decreasing, decreasing positive values. So a decreasing positive slope. Yes. Uh, ooh, yes, I should have started from uh, minus 6.4. Thank you. Um, yeah, we jumped up to 6.4, and then I drew this line, but I should have been drawing it from up there. Yeah, thank you. So what would have happened uh, here when I did this calculation is if we if we calculated the areas of these two, right? They wouldn't have uh, they wouldn't have taken us back to zero. So then it would have been an indication that we had done something wrong. But thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that important observation. Okay, let's try that again. Okay. So we're jumping up to 6.4, constant negative values, constant negative slope like this. There we go. Okay, um, and then let's do, let's reevaluate where we get to here. Right, a 6.4, did we have that actual, uh, actual value right here? 6.4 subtract plus minus four times five. Yeah, we did have this, right? So minus 25, so we had minus 13.6 over here, so we actually had the right value there. Um, and then we jump up, but okay, so we had, right, okay, so we had the right value here, but we had the, uh, the wrong line shown for it. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much for indicating, we're pointing that out. Okay, um, so, Let's mark off that point because we know that's going to be a special uh, location there. We're going to have a slope of zero, so um, a local maximum in this case at that location. There we go. Okay, so for drawing the moment diagram, look at the shear diagram, okay, and we've got no point moments acting along the beam, so you can draw the moment diagram only by looking at the shear diagram. So we're gonna start at zero on the moment diagram, and we'll see if I can, I can draw this one correctly the first time. Uh, we've got positive values starting off, so we have a positive slope starting off here, and then we've got decreasing positive values, so we have to have a decreasing positive slope. So something that uh, goes like this, that actually looks like it has a maximum before it reaches that dashed line. Try that again, something like this, okay. And then the values turn negative, right? Negative values that are increasingly large negative numbers, so a negative slope that's becoming increasingly steep. Now again, there's the question of do we cross the x-axis, don't we cross the x-axis? Again, look at uh, having to end at zero and the values just preceding zero here, it's a positive value, so that means at this location here, we need a positive slope. So we need to be coming into zero with a positive slope. Okay, so that means we must be coming in from below the x-axis. So this must drop down below 
the x-axis like this, and then we have a line like this coming back in, right? Decreasing positive slope, decreasing positive values, okay? So two uh, moments of interest here, M1 and M2, right? Not clear which the largest of those are, okay? Um, so for um, moment M1, let's, uh, let's get that first. So in order to determine moment M1, we need the area of this triangle here, right? The value of that triangle is going to be equal to the value of M1. Easiest thing to do is just write an equation for this linear line and uh, set it equal to zero to find that point there. So in the form for a straight line, here we have y equals mx plus b or v equals ml plus b in this case. Uh, we have got our slope. We know what the slope of that line is because the slope's the value of the distributed load. It's minus 4l plus the y-intercept, which is 6.4, right? And we just set this equal to 0 and solve for l. So what do we get as a decimal value for there? l equals uh, 1.6. 1.6 meters. So then M1 is just the area here, which is one half of 1.6 multiplied by the height, 6.4 gives us 5.12. Okay, um, now for M2. M2 is easy to calculate uh, because we know the change between the end and M2 is going to be equal to the area of this portion of the shear diagram, uh, which is easy, one half the base, three, and the height, 12. 12, 24, 36, we've got minus 18 kilonewton meters here, okay? So M2, M2 is the maximum moment. Okay. So let's, uh, Let's continue here and get the value of y bar now. So y bar is the sum of a y bar over the sum of a or a1 y bar 1 plus a2 y bar 2 over a1 plus a2. Right, where we're going to, let's say, let's take this top shape here, there, and call that shape number one, and take this bottom rectangle and call it shape number two, okay? Um, so for shape uh, rectangle one, we've got, what, 180 multiplied by 50, multiplied by y1 bar, if we're measuring y bar of the whole cross section, right, from the datum that's the base, then we need to measure the centroid location from each of, for each of these shapes to the same uh, datum. So this is y bar 1, and that's going to be, what, half of 180, which is 90, plus 50 is going to give us 140. And then we do the same thing for rectangle two, the base piece. So we've got 160 multiplied by 50, multiplied by the distance from the base to the centroid of that component shape, which is 25. 
and then we'll divide that all by the summation of the areas. So both have a common thickness of 50, so we can factor that out and add up 160 plus 180 here. Okay. So that's going to give us, let's see, um, what do I get when I do that? 85.9 millimeters. All right, and now we can do the parallel axis theorem to figure out what Ixx is of the whole cross section. So we've got Ixx is equal to the summation of I plus AD squared, right? This N term here. Uh, being added into the simple superposition to account for the fact that the centroidal axes of these component shapes are at different vertical locations compared to the centroidal axis of the whole shape. So for the first, uh, the upright piece of the, the T, um, we've got 1 12th, I'm going to move this over a little bit, 1 12th Base is 50 millimeters, height cubed 0.18 cubed plus the area 0 0.05, 0 0.18, and then our distance d squared, which is again the distance, this is d1, um, the distance between the centroid for shape one and the centroid for the whole cross section. So we've got up to that centroid was 140, 90, plus 50, 0 0.14. Subtract the centroid height for the whole cross section, which we said was 85.9, 0 0.08859, and square this. And then we add on the same thing for the other piece, 1 12th, the base 0 0.16, the height 0 0.05, cube that, add on 0 0.16, 0 0.05, and then the overall centroid location, which is 85.9 millimeters, subtract the centroid height here and that will give us our value of d2. Uh, so that will be 25 millimeters that we should be subtracting. Okay, so now we've got our value of Ixx. Do, 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 do. 8.198 times 10 to the negative 5. 8.198 times 10 to the negative 5 units of meters to the fourth power again. Okay, so now we're all set to actually return to our equation. Anybody have um, a question? I'm gonna I'm gonna erase the stuff over here. Anybody have a question about any of that before? I take the eraser to it. All right, let's do it. Let's wipe it clean. Okay, so let's just resketch this cross section to uh, explain. All right, so here's the centroid of the whole cross section. Uh, it's at a location of 85.9 millimeters from the base. That's Y bar. Um, if this beam is going off in this direction and here's our centroidal axis of bending, 
uh, which direction is the maximum moment occurring in? Well, the maximum moment, which is M2, is negative. Negative internal moment means that it's placing the top of the beam in, uh, in tension, the bottom of the beam in compression. So the maximum moment must be oriented like this. So here on the bottom, we have the maximum values of compressive stress that are going to exist in the beam. And up here, we have the maximum values of tensile stress that are going to occur in the beam, right? And which of these are going to be larger? Is the maximum tensile stress going to be larger than the maximum compressive stress? Vice versa, are they going to be equal? Um, the answer, of course, is that the maximum tensile stress is going to be larger than the maximum compressive stress. Why? Because between, let's say, this location here and that location there, the only thing that changes in the equation for bending stress is your variable y. And y for that top point is greater than the distance y for the bottom point, right? So in this case here, sigma max tension, right, the tensile, maximum tensile stress is going to be greater than sigma max compression. Right? Maximum tensile stress is going to be greater than maximum compressive uh, stress. But look, look also what we have. We have the ultimate um, compressive strength of the wood was 38.2 megapascals and the ultimate tensile strength is going to be or was 74 megapascals both coming from the material property table. So stronger in tension than in compression but tensile stress is higher than compressive stress. So it's not clear, right, whether or not the beam is going to fail or have the limiting safety factor due to the compressive stress or the tensile stress. So we'll calculate the safety factor for both tensile stress and compressive stress and compare the two. Okay? And then the minimum safety factor is the safety factor B, okay? So uh, for tensile stress, let's do tensile stress first, okay? So we're going sigma U tension divided by the safety factor, right, for tensile failure is going to be given by M max and then here, this distance is y max here, right? That's the largest distance of y we can go. That's the distance y for the greatest tensile stress. So we have y max over here, and then we have i x x. Okay, so let's put in our values. We've got 74 megapascals times 10 to the 6 divided by our safety factor for tension equals our maximum moment, which was 18 kilonewton meters, 18 times 10 to the 3, multiplied by the maximum value of y, which is the total height of the cross section, uh, which I need to refer back to the diagram for. So that was 180 plus 50 is 230. So we've got 230 millimeters. Okay, that 230 comes from uh, this total height here was 230 millimeters originally. So 230 minus 85.9 okay, gives us y maximum. 
and then divided by ixx, where ixx is this number here, 8.198 times 10 to the minus 5. Okay, so from this, we can get the safety factor for tensile stress. Let's see what I got. 2.3. Okay, now let's do the same thing for compressive stress. So for compressive normal stress, we've got ultimate strength in compression divided by the safety factor for compressive stress is the maximum moment, because we're calculating the stress at the same longitude location, um, then here, the distance y is going to re be replaced by y bar, because that's the farthest we can go from the neutral axis of bending to the bottom. Right. The material that's in compression farthest away from the neutral axis of bending lies at a distance of y bar from the centroidal axis. And then we have ixx, same value again. So let's put in our numbers. So we've got 38.2 megapascals times 10 to the 6 divided by our safety factor for compression is going to equal the maximum moment, 18 times 10 to the 3, 18 kilonewtons, multiplied by y bar, 85. 0.9 millimeters divided by ixx, same number, 8.198 times 10 to the minus 5. So plug and chug that. Uh, safety factor in compression came out to be 2.02 for me. All right, so um, overall, what is the uh, safety factor of the beam? Safety factor is the smaller of those two, right? So the um, minimum safety factor is established by looking at compressive failure of the wood. And so we've got 2.0 for a rounded number for that. All right. Um, nothing in the chat there. Um, questions about that problem there. People uh, comfortable with why we had to check both of these? If, if the maximum internal moment had have been in this direction instead of this direction, then would you have to check both locations? No, right? Because the largest stress would have been a compressive stress, right? So the maximum stress in the beam would have been a maximum compressive stress, right? And we know that the wood's weaker in compression than it is in tension. So in this case, you'd only have to check the safety factor um, for compressive stress. But because the moment's this way around and you've got um, greater tensile stress, but also greater tensile strength. It's not clear whether the limiting factor is going to be um, tensile failure or compressive failure. Okay, so those were the problems that I had uh, I picked out. So those will set you up very well to do the um, problem set for this week. Um, and a bit of extra... Uh, 
review there on shear and moment diagrams for you if you haven't done the quiz already uh, for tomorrow. Um, so I'll stick around and answer questions as people are leaving. And uh, for those of you who aren't sticking around for any questions, um, have a great uh, rest of your week.